The Mills family and their representative have viewed and have no objections to the contents of this video. Some text card annotations have been added as a result of their input. Please consider donating to the Linnea Foundation, as I have. Link in the description and comments. Hello, Jim here. Thanks for joining. Today gives me no pleasure to have a look at a dive that was actually a fatality. If the information I can gather on it is uh, accurate, this is a really heartbreaking story, and my heart goes out to the family. This incident occurred in November of 2020 in uh, Lake McDonald Glacier National Park, Montana. And uh, it was, as I said, it was a fatality of an 18-year-old girl. Um, pardon me on the pronunciation, either Linnea or Linnea Rose Mills. And uh, she was diving with the Gull Dive Center. So the dive was at Lake McDonald in Glacier National Park, Montana. If I hadn't said that already, this one really messed me up. Let me say, I actually, I, this was uh, given to me about a couple weeks ago, a week or two ago, about by one of my dive masters, Martin, thank you. He had sent me the link and I read it and I was thinking back then whether to do a video or not. And I was looking through the information. I've got three sources here and honestly, it was very hard to make uh, heads or tails. So I'm just going to say uh, I, I, this is very, I, I was not going to make a video in the beginning, but now uh, that I've looked at everything uh, that I can find, this is very worth uh, a look at. Now in the link below, I'm going, I've got three news sources. Uh, there is uh, the video by Mark at Simply Scuba. He put up a video. And most importantly, I have the link to the scuba board discussion. That's a very uh, good discussion. And there's a link to the legal filing, which I just got finished uh, reading. It's huge. It's like 115 pages. And it has some photos in there as well. The news reports were all over the place, and I couldn't really make sense of it. Long story short, this young woman who was an open water diver. She had been certified in Australia with, uh, had a total of five or six dives total. I think that's including her certification dives. I think it was 1.5 to two years prior, depending on the date that, that you believe here. And she had not dove in those years after her open water in the, those clear warm water dives and she was getting her advanced here at uh, the park. Now, I think the reason why she was involved in some volunteer or study, let's see why she was doing that. Her impetus for diving was being involved with the marine biology projects at the University of North Carolina. So she, she was quite a wonder. She did some childhood schooling in Bhutan, scuba certified in North Carolina at 15. Ah, Exchange student to Australia where she dived the Great Barrier Reef at 16 and then she's done some other adventure stuff. So she was certified at 15. At 16 she had some more dives. It's not clear how many dives she had total, but the previous dives in Australia were 1.5 to 2 years before this cold water experience. Gosh, she, she decided to do it in November. Kudos to, to her. That's just amazing. Now, as I said, there was a lot of mixed information in this, and it's hard to know uh, who who to believe, but there seems to be a gelling of, of the facts. So she was doing her advanced with this Gull Dive Center, and she did one dive uh, in Sealy Lake, and it was obviously, this is cold. Um, this is, it's also at altitude, so it's at, what, 3,200 feet, I think? So just about 1,000 meters four degrees centigrade, so just above freezing. So Lake Sealy, she did the, her first dive for advance. Now there's a lot of allegations about how they were or were not uh, preparing her for uh, this advanced course and lack of briefings and briefings before dives and course briefing. Now for the first dive, she wore two wetsuits. She had a wetsuit. She felt like it might not be enough. Someone else canceled the dive. They gave her the wetsuit. She dove. I guess that was obviously cold would have been dang cold for me, four degrees centigrade. That's way below wetsuit temperature for me. The dive center told her after that, this Gulf Dive Center, well, you might want to purchase a, a dry suit for your subsequent dives for this course. And she agreed. Now, she was renting the equipment from this Gull Dive Center. And they, the, the dive center, according, this is according to the legal briefing now, the, the dive center arranged for her to speak with some customers of, of Gull Dive Center about uh, buying used dry suits off them. 
So for this, uh, Linnea and another uh, dive customer, dive student of theirs, they worked out a deal, Brooks, Brooks Dry Suits. I'm not familiar with the brand. I don't know if they're neoprene or if they're uh, shell suits. This does matter a little bit here. From, from then on, I tell you, this, this is a, a typical cluster of one failure of protocols and, and or equipment after, or judgment after another. This is a perfect storm. And if what I'm reading is correct, you know, I, I would hope someone or someone's from this dive center goes to jail. If this were my, my, uh, one of my sons, I, I'd have to really uh, be really tough not to go postal on this place. Uh, let, let's, let's continue our look here. For the dry suit dive, so there was no pre-check of, of the dry suit and something happened. So in the news reports, it says that the dry suit did not have an inflator valve, which, which is incorrect. So at first when I was reading, I thought, ah, she bought um, a, a kayak dry suit by mistake, something I almost did when I was shopping for dry suits way, way, way back. I didn't know what a dry suit was. So a kayak dry suit is not gonna have an inflator on it. It did have an inflator. What happened was the person she bought it from did not have the inflator hose and the rental rig she was using did not have a hose to hook up to it. So when she rocked up uh, here on the beach, they, they realized, oh my gosh, you know, you don't have a hose. And apparently, so there was at least one instructor on site and one, I can't make out the details, some sort of, of an assistant, not really an assistant instructor, someone who's certified, but is in the position of assisting with the course, right? I'm not sure what they call it in Patty. Uh, and now he will be a certified dive assistant. And, you know, they're supposed to go through a little bit of training uh, and, you know, have a certain number of dives and, you know, they can kind of assist. Um, they had someone like that here and there might have been another instructor. I'm adding a clarification here from the family representative. The dive shop employee was acting as a dive master in training. At least that's what the students were told. But his highest certification level was junior open water diver. I don't have any information on what training and or certification this employee received to serve in this role. Now, what happened was they found out, the instructor knew she did not have the ability to inflate the dry suit. And so, but told her, you'll be okay. Just use your BC for buoyancy, kind of ignoring the whole other point of, of a dry suit. In addition, according to the lawsuit, that instructor put 24 pounds of lead weight into the pockets of her BCD. And I do not think that was ditchable. It's hard to tell from the lawsuit. And another 20 pounds of lead into the pockets of the dry suit. So that's 44 pounds of lead. I think at least most or all of it non-ditchable. So that's 20 kilograms into this uh, poor girl suit and she does not have the ability to supplement her buoyancy with the dry suit if, if she needed to in emergency, which unfortunately comes in in here. So there was no there was no meaningful buddy check. They found out she didn't have a hose. Instructors out there, I know you're like me, you know, I during dry suit season in my, my dive bag, I have like four extra um, hoses for, for dry suit because, you know, we'll have people to rent them. I can't depend on the dive centers to have them. So I'm always, I'm always losing my dry suit hoses like that as well. I, I, uh, yeah, folks don't, you know, don't, don't dive with a, with a dry suit that you can't inflate. Uh, so another perfect storm here is, so they were supposed to start diving at two sunset is like at five 30. They weren't getting into the water until like five, five Oh eight, something like that. Nobody, none of the students had dive torches. I don't know, you know, what these guys were thinking. Yeah, the dive started at 5.08 p.m., six minutes before sunset. Come on, guys. Now, this, this lake gets deep. It gets to almost 500 feet at its deepest point. And uh, at the entry area, it has, has some, some shelving that, that goes on. So pretty quickly, what, what happened to this young lady is she was buddied up with this guy. We'll, we'll, the lawsuit calls him Bob. I, I don't know if that's his real name or not. A clarification here. Linnea did not, in fact, have a buddy assigned at the start of the dive. Bob was buddied with his 14-year-old daughter, but she, the daughter, got out of the water at the beginning of the dive. So when I refer to Bob as Linnea's buddy, what that means in this context is that Bob came to Linnea's aid 
as if he were her buddy. I have another clarification from the family representative here. Linnea did not have a dive buddy. Bob was buddied with his 14-year-old daughter, but she, that means the daughter, got out of the water at the beginning of the dive. Bob, Bob had, a, had a GoPro on his, on his wrist as well, I think. Pretty quickly into the dive, she um, just sank down to you know, one shelf after another. I think the first one, yeah, so at about 60 feet, yeah, a depth of 59, 60 feet. At the beginning of the dive, Bob and Linnea were led out into the open water by the instructor, Debbie Snow. Bob and the instructor, Snow, were soon at 50 foot, while Linnea was at 60 foot by six minutes into the dive. What it appeared, right, so she's not able to inflate this dry suit at all, so she was being squeezed. Now, I, I can't say, I've been squeezed pretty good. I, I don't know, down to 60 feet with no squeeze. And also, my, my sense is different dry suits squeeze different ways. For example, my suit is a, a trilaminate suit, and that will pack you like, like a vacuum-packed chicken wing. So, for example, if, if, if your arm is in this position, that, that suit is going to suck up right here, and your, your arm will be stuck in that position. You will not be able to bend it or unbend it. And that would go for everything, everywhere where the suit is. Um, it would suck up so hard that you would be like a vacuum-packed creature in, in a, a vacuum bag. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't really be able to fin that well. You, wouldn't be able, you might not be able to reach your regulator or, or inflator if there were an inflator valve on there. So her buddy was, was trying to help her or come down just to check in her at 59 feet, 60 feet, it's 18 meters. And, you know, she was trying to wave for help. And in that way for help, she fell backwards down the next level. Um, and let me see. So she was breathing hard, kicking, but could not ascend. She was trying to communicate with the instructor and the other divers. No, the other, they weren't paying attention to her not saying they were purposely excluding her, but they had another dry suit student that was having some ear issues and maybe they were paying more attention to that student. In this photo, the family representative describes, here you can see Debbie Snow swimming over Linnea on the bottom at 60 feet with Nathan Dudden and Seth Liston near her and ascending. Seth is that assistant, I believe. This is a screenshot from the video, the video that was on the wrist of Bob. Debbie and Seth have lights, the students do not. What highlights here is I think you can see Linnea signaling for Debbie, the instructor, but she doesn't seem to be looking in that direction at all. So she fell down to the next level to 85 feet. So I don't know, almost high 20s uh, meters. Um, his buddy Bob was, was following her down, down there and he was trying to help her, but he couldn't, he couldn't lift her. Um, and it seemed like she couldn't breathe because of the squeeze is what they're saying here. I have to mention here a request from the family. On page 50 of this legal document, just before where I am on the screen now, there's a picture of Linnea's final moments. The family has asked all of us not to distribute that photo to the internet out of respect for Linnea and the family. Now somehow she dropped her regulator, it says here, and Bob was trying to uh, give, donate, and help her breathe for a minute, a minute and a half. He was also trying to get the weights out, but he didn't understand what was going on because he couldn't find her weight belt and he didn't know there were weights in her uh, dry suit pockets. Were zippered into her, right? So they were zippered into the BCD pockets. So also those were non-releasable. So she had 20 kilos of non-releasable weight. Okay, yeah, then her regulator dropped out and he, Bob was donating his. He was doing his best, and then apparently he was starting to run out of air. He was trying to lift her up. He couldn't do it. By now, they were at 105 feet, so that was below 30 meters, and maybe still tumbling a bit. He stayed with her until she lost consciousness. This wasn't clear if because she was having lost the regulator, was having trouble breathing. Think of how this guy felt. Um, so he was low on air. He was kind of like, what do I do? He was also maybe running into NDL time. He quickly swam to the surface, so he swam right up from 30 meters. And actually, I, I think he went to the chamber later. Uh, at least one person went to the chamber later because of a fast ascent. I think it was as a precaution. Uh, so he surfaced in less than one minute and yeah, more than triple the rate of a safe ascent. All right, so the instructor eventually went down. 
Another clarification from a family representative, the employee assistant did not try to assist Linnea on the bottom. Instead, after Bob surfaced, Snow, the instructor, tried to find Linnea unsuccessfully. Afterward, the divers returned to shore to change tanks. That's when the employee and instructor went back in and down. They found Linnea, but the employee, Seth, blew to the surface, leaving the instructor to recover Linnea alone. Was unable to, to lift her without removing that BC totally. That's how negative this poor girl was. Um, once she was on shore, now here's the other perfect storm of incompetence by this, this dive center. So apparently they were out of cell phone range. There were no phones there. Like the nearest phone was minutes or almost half an hour uh, drive away. So they had a couple there that was from Florida who volunteered to drive out and uh, and call. Just unbelievable, right? Um, and I, I didn't see this in the legal filing, but it's it's in the news. Apparently, allegedly, this dive center had a fatality the year before and somehow didn't report that to, to Patty, their Patty Dive Center. Patty's also being sued in this in this uh, allegation because apparently you know they were saying that maybe the standards either weren't followed and patty should have known or uh the patty standards were deficient in some way but anyway there was a, a a fatality the year before they rented out um gear to a diver and i might have recalled from a news report or in a forum that it was reported that the rental regulator was somehow defective or misassembled However, what is for sure is that it was rented to an uncertified diver and that diver passed away on the dive. Afterwards, it's alleged that there might have been some sort of a cover-up. They didn't report it to Patty. This says, now I'm finding that the news reports, the three different news reports have almost conflicting facts. And I don't see how that could be because, you know, my insurance, for example, if, if I'm Nowy Insurance, Nowy, if I don't report a fatality or an incident, it's their lawyer that's going to protect me. So if I don't report it, how do I have legal coverage? I, I don't know. I, I don't understand that at all. It was pointed out to me by the family representative that pages 12 and 13 of the complaint detail specifics of the previous death connected to Gull Dive. Anyone curious about that should check those pages. Apparently, the, the lawsuit also alleges that this, this buddy of hers, Bob, that the dive center attacked him as the culprit and... Apparently, after they found out that he had photographic evidence and that he was kind of on her side. So this is a really, really ugly situation. As an aside, this incident makes me remember uh, one point that I used to mention on rescue, and that is the rescue of a overweighted uh, dry suit diver. And what I used to instruct students was in the event that you can't get a dry suit diver up, someone's overweighted or out of air or whatever, uh, to use their seal, right? Take your regulator out and open this seal and shoot air up and into the torso through through the arm. I have no idea if that would have been helpful in this situation. Uh, I assume it, it might have been. That That's 2020 hindsight. However, I'm going to put that back into my rescue course. Just watching this, it, it made me remember that I, I neglected to, to keep this highly, highly unlikely uh, technique in my course, but I will bring it back. So as a recap, there is a lot going on here, but uh, apparently failure to brief properly on the dive, failure to brief on the use of a dry suit, uh, failure to get a hose or keep a student out of a hose with the dry suit, no dry suit training. Uh, it's unclear whether the instructor, the lead instructor, uh, is qualified to instruct someone in the use of a dry suit or not. And then there are the standards of the standard of care, how were they were they not watching properly in the water, which it definitely appears not. On this point, highlighting the duty of care, the family representative wanted to clarify that uh, we could also see pages 46 and 47 for the glaring atrocity of how close the instructor and assistant were to Linnea as she struggled, but never looked at her or asked her for the okay signal. All of this is captured on the GoPro, so there's no doubt about what happened. That would be the GoPro that was on Bob's wrist. Lack of emergency procedures, uh, and it goes on and on. But uh, this is a really, really sad uh, story. I don't do a lot of the specialties, right? The Patty or the Nowy specialties. There's one specialty that I do, and that's dry suit. And 
if you're if you're out there if you're going to use a dry suit right definitely get a dry suit course um, and the, the one reason why I, I recommend that to folks is one because you know this is a dangerous it's a dangerous piece of equipment potentially right it's a whole other skill that you have to master also I thought that in the states because of litigation that you know if you travel in the states and you want to rent a dry suit you would need for liability reasons you would need a certification and that's what I what I tell folks if you're going to be diving a dry suit which is a great skill you know take it seriously get the good training be confident in your training center in your instructor life-saving training with life-saving equipment is never a place where you want to cut corners so let's keep that in mind in closing this is obviously an incredible tragedy that was totally avoidable my thoughts go out to the family, and I would like to thank the family representative for giving me the facts and, and checking my work. I'd like to ask everybody to please consider donating to the Linnea Foundation. And again, I will put that link in the description and will also be in the video comments below. Last, I invite all of you to observe a minute of silence in memory of Linnea.